yearning to play a few rounds of Gwent. That ought to set me straight. It's Commanders Horn episode 102. It's the grand opening of Gwent Homecoming. On December 4th, Gwent received its first balancing patch, as well as console release along with Thronebreaker. So lots of people playing Homecoming for the first time, and others might just be returning. Joining me to talk about this patch is Quill and Lance. So let's get into it on this episode of Commanders Horn. Good afternoon, friends. It is December 6th, 2018. A great time to catch up with my little weekly Gwen podcast. Joining me, the artistic and deadly Quill and Lance from Team Leviathan. Thanks for joining me on the show today, Lance. How are you? No problem. I'm doing uh, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. All right. We'll take pretty good. I am also pretty good. I am well, you could even say. I uh, had, uh, had a pretty exciting morning. Then I just finally just got home out of the cold and snow and sit down here and just chat about some Gwent. My idea of a good evening. Uh, so it's a big day. It's a big, well, it's a big day. It's a big, uh, the sixth, uh, sorry, the fourth was a big day. The fourth being the grand opening of Thronebreaker and, uh, of course, Homecoming for console. And I had a couple, I have a friend who plays on PlayStation 4, and uh, I've been trying to get him into card games forever, right? I played Magic a little bit. I played Hearthstone for a long time as well. And uh, none of them really stuck, but Gwent stuck with him because he could play it on PS4. Uh, and we know that I know that I have a lot of people in the chat that are PS4 players that are happy to get back into their accounts. But a lot of new people and a lot of people are coming back. Quill, have you seen? You're you are a streamer of Gwent, of course. Uh, of course, I'll be uh, introduce yourself. Of course, uh, let everybody know where you're from and how you got into Gwent. And then we'll talk about the community and the streams. Alrighty, um, normally not one for talking about myself, but uh, I'm Quill and Lance I'm from you know United States, Wisconsin, actually, um, land of the cheese and beer. Um, I got into things. Gwent after, uh, after college and, uh, about, it was probably the, right after, uh, close beta ended, like right as it started to come out on consoles and stuff. Um, I saw it on Xbox and yeah. I loved Gwent from the Witcher three, uh, didn't finish it yet, uh, which chat still bullies me for, but, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm the same. happy that I found it. I never finished the X Pack. That was that's that's my that's my mark of shame. I never even I never played in the in the great uh, Gwent tournament in Toussaint. I never did it. Uh, where I think you have to play the Skellige faction, which makes it difficult because you can't play the broken stuff. Um, yeah, 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 something like that. But uh, yeah, so I mean, everybody has that gateway, right? I mean, well, not everybody, not everybody. I mean, I think the life coach uh, migration generally probably didn't have this, but uh, the fan, the Witcher fandom, the people that know the have the familiarity from actually the experience that they had in wild hunt as opposed to just being a card gamer so you are you are more so are you would you say that you're a card gamer or did you come in from being a witcher fan or is it a mix of both um so i'm trying to figure out where on this camera I can, i'm trying to get so i'm not to the side but um <laughs> <laughs> i uh I, I actually played a bit of Yu Gi Oh! Um, okay. and Duel Masters when I was really young. Okay. Um, I went to card game shops, uh, rode my bike like four miles there every weekend to go hang out with all the, the, the older people that were playing it because I was like in what fifth and maybe fifth to sixth grade. Okay. And uh, like it, it was awesome because there's like, despite the age difference, they, they treated me like I was kind of like almost like an equal, whereas I didn't get that with like friend groups and social groups normally mm. so it's one thing that kind of drew me to card games is how you know generally nice everyone was and you can see it with the gwent community for the most part too um despite the salt that can inevitably happen i mean at the end of the day yeah um, the salt unfortunately comes with the digital landscape i think because you have uh, you know all the all the intersecting opinions at all times yeah yeah and i'm i'm trying to get better at my my own salt mm. problems but at, at the end of the day it's like you know, I love the the friendliness overall of the Gwent community, and that's what that's what drew me to it, and you know, it kept me going through you know the the darker times where you know we're sitting there for six months without a content patch, and um, so it does happen. You know. It has happened, but the but that is over, and now the the last batch of waiting is also over as we are now in 
patch territory. So I wanted to talk to you about, um, also, I mean, we should just, I also wanted to talk to you about, um, uh, cause I met, I met you at wild hunt two. Um, well, I guess I met you at wild hunt one, but you weren't in wild hunt one, the actual tournament, but you were present. Because it's not too no, far. No, no, no. I wasn't even at Wild Hunt 1, actually. Oh, you were just... Oh, okay, right. Okay, so you were only at Wild Hunt. I, I, we were talking beforehand, chat. We were talking... I was convinced I met Quill twice. Like, just... Conv- I'm still convinced. I'm, I'm convinced... I'm just that magical of a personality. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying you're so magical that I feel like I got two visits worth in the one time yeah, we actually yeah, yeah, did yeah, we. Yeah, yeah. So you played in Wild Hunt 2. How was the experience with you being part of... Uh, really, it's like the only... That, that Gwent experience for the people that have ever been part of a tournament before... Um, is unique to Wild Hunt. The actual land, the face-to-face stuff only actually happens in Gwent Masters events. You don't get any of that. You know, any of the qualifiers, it's all online. So Wild Hunt is still, Wild Hunt Philadelphia still has that very special place. Um, how was your Wild Hunt experience, and uh, what are you hoping to see in maybe some future events that could be coming out uh, once the pro scene starts up again? Um, I was extremely nervous going and meeting everyone who I had only, you know, had interactions with behind a, behind a keyboard. Um, I am a very anxious person in real life and I'm very quiet and going to fly to another place. I've only been out of Wisconsin once or twice. Oh, I've only wow. been out of Wisconsin twice and, uh, going to, uh, going to Philly was definitely an experience and I was definitely, you know, really nervous at first. So the first day it was kind of meh and then after i kind of got done playing after i was already out of the tournament i got to kind of relax and enjoy myself you know go talk around with people more Mm -hmm. and it it was just so much fun like i can't wait to do something like that again yeah i mean the 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 vibe in philly was great um and it's always good to just to share space with like-minded people i mean we all we're all brought into one space for you know the same reason so we already have so much in common right so it's easy to make friends i felt like it was easy to make friends in philly Um, and of course, you know, uh, meeting people all over the place. Gwent is such a, it's been a good connector. It's always been that it's always been, it's always been for the fans. Uh, and it always has felt like, uh, the communities have been built around it. Uh, the ones that are, the ones that are standing today are the best ones, I think. Um, now you are also not just a, uh, what would I say? Just a regular, you're, uh, I guess, uh, how how many days a week do you stream exactly? It's five days, right? Or is it every day? Um, I try to stream every day, but it doesn't always. Ha- Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I, um, it's it's. I try to get in every day. Um, mm-hmm. I do my best, you know, um, to get it in at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, because yeah. I only stream five days a week. If I stream five days a week, I, I generally don't stream a lot on the weekends, so I tend to lose track of who does like the everyday thing. But uh, you do it frequently enough, and uh, um, so you've been seeing kind of the community. Uh, react to the patch as well, and I'm sure ask you uh, frequently how you feel about the patch. So now you're going to get one more person asking you, and that's me. Um, <laughs> but I just want to talk about one more thing about your stream before we dive into the nitty gritty facts. Is that you don't you're known for doing a little bit of artwork on your stream, and uh, you came into my stream recently where I was trying my hand at that. But you're actually an art student as well. Um, how have you been combining art and streaming, and uh, and uh, what have you gotten out of it? Just as it's a, it's this is something that I've been like kind of going through, and it's uh, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, actually, the the reason I got the idea is a while ago, Gwent servers completely went down out of nowhere, and everybody didn't know what to do. Like, uh, there's there's like Pumpkin was playing Hearthstone in the Gwent section. Oh yeah, like it, it was kind of just chaos that day. People didn't know what to do, and so I was like, okay, well, what do I do? Hmm. I can draw. So I just started drawing until the till the thing lifted, and then people were like, "Yeah, keep going. Keep we kind of like this." Drawing, yeah. Um, so I just started doing it all pretty much daily for a, a period of time, and I have a bunch of them, you know, all saved up. I have like a whole sketchbook full of just portrait work because we're not very good at bodies, but portraits are kind of where uh, kind of where I I sit. Um, and I try to do it every once in a while, but yeah, it's it's it seems harder with the new Gwent because it's you know you're trying to get used to this, but then multitask at the same time. Oh, yeah, playing and I do, drawing, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do it while I'm, yeah, while I, yeah, see, I don't do it while I'm playing. That's uh, that is yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah, yours is probably probably the smarter approach. Ninety nine percent of my brain. You could focus on just getting that one thing nice. Mm. I have to kind of fail at two things. Oh man. Oh no! I mean, I, I I probably would fail at two things if I tried to do them both at the same time, uh, rather than uh, fail at one thing when I just try to play Gwent 100% of the time. 
So we'll talk about Gwent for sure then. Uh, and thanks for sharing that stuff, and thanks for joining me on my stream when I was doing the drawing. I thought I'm like, yeah, oh, man, I'm, it's awesome to see someone else do it, man. I really, uh, I love seeing other people's artwork. Like I get, you know, you get kind of bored of seeing your own stuff when you do it all the time, and seeing the way other people do things is just awesome. And you, uh, and I mean, Gwent's a great game to be uh, a fan of when you like great art because there's not like not a single oh. card looks phoned in by any stretch of the imagination. It's all fantastic stuff as i drop my phone but it's all fantastic stuff yeah if that's one thing about that i will never complain from mm -hmm. from cdpr is it's about the art yeah like they, they always get an a plus there yeah do you have a favorite before we close the uh, conversation yeah it's kind of an easy favorite and kind of like hmm. you know a lot of people's favorite but selkirk oh, selkirk, selkirk is, is definitely so awesome. good yeah selkirk and then uh one that's i feel like goes under the radar because it's just not a very playable card is black rayla she does look great, yeah. I mean, I've been seeing a lot of her, and especially, like, her character in general and, like, all the artwork of her in Thronebreaker as well. Like, she's just like, got a good style. And, yeah, the artwork, the dark blue, like, the night kind of... Uh, yeah, I, I really love the blues. Yeah. Um, I've always liked Kahir. That's always been one of my favorites as well. Yep, his uh, is pretty cool, too. And uh, I like the new Anna Strenger. There's there's a lot... There's 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 a subtleness to that artwork that's just all about, like, what that what's going on with her hand and, like, the way she's holding it. I could talk about this stuff all day, though, but it's it's really, really good stuff. Uh, so, I mean, they do that very, very well, and they've made the game much better for artwork. But they've also made the game much better for playing as well, uh, which is very, very important, of course, because, you know, it's patch time, and we want the game to be in a nice, balanced state as the pro season is going to get started in 2019. So let's talk about that right after this. The homecoming timeline has seen one hot fix four weeks ago and one balancing patch two days ago, which means we'll already be in the third universe in which we're approaching Gwent in just six weeks. So we've seen some huge shifts like artifacts and their counterplay, and we've seen some things hold steady as well. Overall, of it, players have been trying to pioneer their latest and greatest. And now we're back at the seasonal grind as things have just started over in the season of the Wild Hunt. And I will say that it is disappointing that I won't have another shot at that wild hunt border. And I don't think that that's going to really be opening. The gates aren't going to be open on the seasonal trees until January. Um, but, you know, we're still grinding. We're still trying to get our MMR together. And, Quill, I wanted to talk to you because you play you play on the pro ladder. Um, this patch, to me, uh, felt like they were smoothing out provision value, and that was top priority. They said in the patch notes that they wanted to reduce the amount of auto-include, but I also think that a lot of it had to do with pricing out decks that just had rock solid floors with like just super strong like four uh recruit cost units like recruit and nilf guard let's just use an example of one of the cards that was nerfed but that kind of thing like just making it just a little bit dicier as far as card selection um so i think that i think that that's kind of what they did they went out bargain hunting they're like okay well it looks like this is too good it's too easy to put this in the deck so we want to look out sometimes the price was changed sometimes the strength was changed but do you think CD Projekt Red is on the right track if that's what they're trying to do and if they're trying to create a little bit more diversity in the meta and uh, kind of what uh, what a good deck looks like? Um, for the most part, yeah, I kind of expected this out of this patch. Um, I just expected provisional values to change, um, some bug fixes, you know, more of small things like what, what you'd expect out of just a patch, not just like this grand. Um, there are certain things that I was... I was pretty okay with mm -hmm. um with certain cards getting nerfed you know they needed to get at least some provisional changes but at the same time trying to get cards not to be auto include in factions is kind of hard when they're so limited based on the card pool mm -hmm. like i've been finding that i throw witchers in a deck not because i like need the points or i need the, th the thinning really it's just you don't have a lot of options like there's just not a lot of other playable cards. Mm. So you just kind of throw them in there and then the thinning is just worth more than whatever bad cards that are just left that you could throw in there. Yeah, I mean um, it's 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 true. Yeah, the Witcher, we can probably like just start talking about the Witcher change because that's probably like a marquee change. I think we were kind of feeling about neutrals being a bit too strong, especially something that was being played frequently with Roach for the 16 pointer. Uh, and that's something that you could play immediately with the tactical advantage to bring Papa Vesuvir up to nine. And we've seen it a lot. It's not that it wasn't like you could expect it. You could kind of play around it. But at the 
you were expecting it from every deck. Uh, now they are less powerful, worth maybe playing, but it feels like just like round one is just when you just play them in round one and they do their thing and it's not interesting, but it is suffering from still having a strong utility, as you were saying, yeah. I think. So I, I feel like I cut you off before if you had any other thoughts on the Witcher's nerf and maybe uh, by extension the Roach nerf as well, because there's a lot of changes to talk about here. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't just it – was, it was more or less just referring to – it wasn't even just signaling out the Witchers right away. Mm -hmm. It was more or less just getting to the point that even though they're trying to provisionally nerf some of these cards to make them not auto-include, a lot of them still end up being auto-include just based on the fact that there's, you know, so few cards in the card pool to really replace them. Mm -hmm. um, I think, if, I think once we get some expansions going, the, the provisional nerfs will work a lot better in terms of reducing play rates mm -hmm. because – then obviously you'll have a lot more options to choose from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my ongoing uh, my ongoing thoughts about about these changes and homecoming and uh, is that we need to. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've said this verbatim a number of times, but we need to have this foundation. We need we need the cement to dry. We need to have this foundation to build on because it's been this you know it's been this shifting world for so long. Um, so one of the first I do want to talk about this thing though because this is such a great addition. Um, while we did lose. Gwent, or well, we did lose Gwent Tracker, Gwent Up function functionality on PC. Um, we now have something that's available also on console by right clicking your deck. It shows you all the cards in your deck, just like that. I mean, not just like that. It's uh, it says it's random, but it's not. It's actually a sorted by strength level, I believe. So it actually shows it in order of like one to ten or whatever it is, um, and then special cards and artifacts. Uh, so it's actually always showing you in a specific order, but never in the order that your deck is. It is. Just great. Uh, you don't have to worry about. I mean, I'm gonna miss the stat tracking and everything, but it just seems like it just they just dropped that in there because Thronebreaker had it from the get go as well. I uh, I love having it back. How do you feel about it, Quill? Oh, I uh, so I don't know if, how much you know about this about me, but I actually never used a tracker. In, okay, uh, I remember never that. once because I came from console yeah, right. um, initially. Um, so I just never got one on PC. I just hmm. thought it was kind of clunky a lot for the streams, especially when I was doing like more of the art streams too. That was a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So I actually never used one, but at the same rate, I still love it. Like I, I only use it, really use it at round three when like I'm looking for my last couple mulligans, but, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a great addition and honestly, I'm not, I'm really stoked because seeing, seeing stuff like that implemented just is like it gets really excited for what else they can do and what else they're thinking about adding, but mm -hmm. they just need the time. So it's interesting because the functionality of it is it's just like looking at your graveyard. It's just, it seems like the, the thing like, like that fundamentally feels like it's the same thing. I'm clicking a pile to see what cards are in it. So, I mean, I feel like if they were actually going to um, create an interface that actually allowed us to track our cards in some way. It, I wonder if it would be approached differently or if they just felt like, you know what, this is probably the most uh, diplomatic way to do it. It's just like, here are the cards in your deck. That's that. It doesn't take up space when you don't need it. I do like that. And I do also like, um, you know, it just saves you time. Like you could say, oh, did I play both of my X or, you know, eventually you'll remember or you'll get there. But, you know, you could just click it and see. It just saves like valuable seconds valuable seconds as the rope burns um and deck builder filtering i just want to say hooray for that because now we can filter by units and special cards and artifacts just yes yes <laughs> that's all i have to say about that though um but we can talk about the neutral cards now so there's a lot of stuff to talk about i don't want to talk about every single last thing but there are some big ones to talk about for sure. So we can go start in the in the order that was listed here from CD Projekt Red. Xavier Lemons being uh, functionally and spiritually very much the same, just kind of up in price, and now only has a th has a three card cap on banishment on your graveyard or your opponent's graveyard. So more expensive to play, same power level, mostly will do the same thing. Only in the most extreme situations will you not be able to like get your value in three cards. Uh, banishing. So how do you feel about this change overall? It feels like it's actually not that big of a nerf. Um, I feel like the provisions didn't really need to be changed on it. I felt like the just uh, banish three was, was enough. Mm. Um, at least for me. I don't know. I mean, it, it, 
it, like during Big Woody, you still would see not a lot of people playing. Like a lot of people played Zel Xavier initially, but then they turned away from it because mm -hmm. it would just shift the meta around between playing that card and not playing that card. Yeah, and it it kind of forced people to predict the meta a little bit more and actually just learn to play around it because you could still win plenty of games. You could just two all the people like that would have Xavier. You can usually pick out which decks would run it and which mm -hmm. decks wasn't. And just play um, around it, yeah. Uh, like especially with like with Lippy too, mm -hmm. like that would be such a big counter to Lippy. But most Lippy decks can just go for a two zero or something, or do it right away in beginning of round two and not really care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I mean it's almost as if the the meta had shifted away from him uh, before. Like I mean the concept, the general idea is that it's a card that it's a card that um, it hurts specific matchups too much. But the argument is that if this wasn't in the game, those decks would have uh, some sort of advantage in the metagame. But there's no real proof of that, is there? It feels like this was kind of like a failsafe against two heavy graveyard uh, interactions. But when you compare it to like what Greatswords were doing in Vintage Gwent, like the kinds of insane plays you'd have out of the graveyard in Vintage Gwent, I mean, you just don't really have those plays out of the graveyard anymore. It almost seems like Xavier is... It, he's inviting he's inviting a complete shutdown of a deck while not necessarily being needed i guess like it doesn't feel as it, he doesn't feel as required i don't know I, if i'm uh if i'm thinking about it in the right way yeah yeah i kind of agree with that like a, a lot of these decks don't at least i, I don't know if it's just because with the current options we have aren't able to abuse it nearly as much as like what what great swords was doing right mm -hmm. um like the bear decks can get really strong value but you can often still just beat those like even without xavier um so it feels like that's why i'm saying you kind of didn't need the nerf because you can beat those decks regardless like you, you can find other other win cons pretty easily and that's what most people ended up doing is finding a different way to beat those decks that mm -hmm. was that was going to be still good in other matchups as well yeah, like the, I thought that his strength level was going to get changed, and I thought that um, the if he was going to be given a cap, the cap would be two or less. I mean, I don't think the two or three is two is usually enough of enough of a hindrance to a, uh, a deck that cares about it. Then, like, so three feels like overkill. It just doesn't seem like he changed all that much. But I also don't hear. I mean, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about how, like like. I feel like no one's been saying like they really missed the mark on this card, but a lot of people were talking about this card early on. I just find it interesting. I feel like the provision cost is the deadliest thing to this card, but oh, yeah. it just makes him spikier in what he's able to stop. And I guess the 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 way he would devalue your deck if you weren't getting, I mean, at least you're still getting five points on the body, I guess at least if you're silver lining it, but it's not so much of a silver lining at 10 provisions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you're a frequent Siri player, and Siri got nerfed. She got nerfed <laughs> twice. Now Quill played Quill played this filthy double Siri deck with Siri Dash and Siri Vanilla, and just using Aridin to abuse one of those to just make your opponent pull their hair out. Both series get hit. So I mean, I feel like I definitely wanted to talk to you about both the Siri nerf, her power level being changed from six to four, and Siri Dash. Her ability being changed to a five-turn timer, which arguably is arguably is more of a change, uh, because Siri functional changes that don't affect provisions. I feel like, uh, I mean, four is a pretty low threshold when she when she was once at six. But I mean, you were all about that abuse, making her immune, so it doesn't matter how strong she is. So, how do you feel about these Siri yeah. changes? So, I do think the six to four really hurt a lot. Um... It's it's a good change, honestly. She's a pretty disgusting card at six. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I agree that it should have been lowered. Um, it does hurt a lot because I typically want to, you know, from when we we're we we're co-oping a bit, mm -hmm. you go and immune the the Siri dash right away. That's like your main immune target. Mm -hmm. um, and she's just kind of see if you can get an extra card uh, in the next round. And most of the time, I've been playing the deck now. I just altered it a little bit so I could keep dreaming. Keep and dreaming. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. <laughs> and uh, the the four Siri always dies. Yeah. Um. So I I guess decks that really wouldn't care about that that four points are decks that can buffer. I mean, if you're gonna go for the immune on her with Aridin, that's fine. Or like more Ren Voorhees with Reveal. I've been mm -hmm. seeing people 
doing well with that because they can just get her back up to six anyway. Six at least, but you know, more yeah. than being able to, you can just use all. I mean, I don't think it's, it would be right to do this, but you can use all your charges. He basically has a six yeah. buff at any given time, like Groover sort of. Well, I've seen them do a lot of uh, buff up by two, and then if if I hit it, then they emissary it. I've been seeing a yeah. lot of that emissary. Yeah, that's so. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, protecting Siri has always been. I feel like history is repeating itself a little bit. I don't know how much history you have, Quill, but I mean, Siri being strong and then nerfed in power and then not played and then slowly creeping back up and then oh we'll give her a little bit of armor now I'm like okay i guess maybe the effect is what it is and then we they found a sweet spot perhaps and then they release homecoming and she's she's a powerhouse all over again yeah 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 for the longest time though i've i've i've, re- I've known her as like unplayable basically mm-hmm. um because well, that's gets, my experience with it. She just gets killed, right? She just gets removed yeah. in some way. Or yeah, and you know, you're your point. And it's kind of funny that she's strong that she was strong in in a meta where there's removal everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was uh, the immunity stuff was I mean I only ever saw Siri in S- Siri really only started living in uh in uh some Aridin decks really because of uh, what you can do with Karen Theory and what you can do obviously with Aridin making Siri's immune. Um so I feel like Siri was getting a bit more restricted there but when you were rest- if you're restricting a card that has the ability of generating card advantage to one deck that could make it work i think i mean it doesn't seem okay uh but i also don't really know how you can make a card that's super super vulnerable and very very strong i mean aridin's always going to have that niche kind of carved yeah. out for him and like i, I never liked aridin from the get-go honestly with the immune ability i felt like he, there's always going to be something you can abuse with him mm-hmm. Um, and it's just going to be this niche deck that, like, uh, you can't really do anything about unless you have Scorch, basically, or just some type of non-targeted removal. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of the non-targeted removal, personally, because Aridin scares the hell out of me. But at the <laughs> same time, if you run the right non-targeted removal, like, you know, an Epidemic, which uh, we will talk about next, but also, like... Glorious Hunt or something for Sosynthesis, like you can catch stuff at least and like know that you're always going to hit Spear Tip and you know, other like threatening cards. But um, I feel like I'm still not seeing a lot. Of, I see Aridin every now and then, and it's it's not really common. But um, well, it, on the pro ladder, I see it a lot more. Yeah, um, well, thanks, yeah. thanks to Green Knight Green and his. Knight. Uh, <laughs> that deck is probably one of the stronger decks in the game right now, at least. And it's uh, like it, that 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 didn't really change either in the patch. Too, too yeah, much. it stayed it stayed pretty much the same. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that deck. I did my. Yeah, uh, I've been running in a ton week. of people playing it. Hmm. Maybe I'll play that next. I'm doing all my placement <laughs> stuff again, right? So I'm just like, all right, I got to stick. I got to stick with the faction till the diamond is full. So I'm working on Henselt at the moment. Um, yeah, I was. I was too. I was trying to figure out something. I'm think. I was thinking. I was trying to play like uh, a. Very, very annoying artifact based Henselt deck with uh, Henselt's targets being like the Trebs or something that can just go for like the big push um, uh, at any given time to take the round because Henselt can do some pretty crazy stuff, especially with the Kidwenny Knights. But anyway, <laughs> we talk about Henselt theory crafting maybe when we get to the Northern Realms part. Um, the Epidemic recruit class going from eight to nine. Uh, I feel like they just keep tuning this card. I feel like the solution is really make this a gold card, personally. I mean, I think nine is fair, be- but I feel like we're balancing around, like, th- these are, like, this- the issue has been freedom of pinging, like, Ethna being able to customize, like, all this stuff, and, like, Spears, which have been nerfed, and Ethna's now been nerfed, now Epidemic twice nerfed in six weeks. I think... This card is still very, very strong, and I think that having two of them might be uh, showcasing its strength a little bit higher than it actually needs to be. I don't know. Do you agree with that one? Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing it gold since it's like the counterpart to Scorch, right? It, it yeah. kind of feels a little weird that there's just one Scorch, but then there's multiple Epidemics. Because in this game, Epidemics can often be better than, especially now, now better than Scorches. Yeah. Now, especially, it was terrible. In in I mean, in in Vintage went the the card values would go from like one on the body to like 20. But now yeah. the card values can line up at like three, four, very uh, commonly without your interaction at all. But you can also create these situations where you just wipe your opponent's board out. Um, I mean, I like, I like control. So I think that it's cool to play these cards a lot of the time, but I feel like, I don't know, maybe, maybe bronze is 
Maybe the jury's out on that one. But then on the inverse, Scorch getting a whopping three provision cost increase from eleven to fourteen. I don't have Yikes. I don't have too much criticism about this patch, but this feels bad to me. It feels like this is too much about specific. I mean, there's a lot of like single pings, double pings, and there's a lot of stuff that every deck can utilize. But I feel like Scorch being such kind of like a such a defining card that's never changed in Gwent's history all the way back to Wild Hunt. It's just been the card. You went from being able to have three of these things and al some alpha builds as a bronze card, much like Epidemic was, then it was made a silver card, and now it's like one of the most expensive gold cards in the game. I think this is just, I feel like it's an unnecessarily high provision cost for this card. Like, I don't know. I, I was making Scorch work here and there. I was definitely not dominating with Scorch. Uh, I was having much more fun with Epidemic specifically, and uh, maybe Shiru if I really wanted to go crazy with like uh, board customization and like puzzle solving within the game. But 11 to 14, one of the highest ever crew cost shifts we've seen. What's your hot take on this on this card? <laughs> pun intended. I like that pun. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't like it because I wanted... See, I wanted to try out he he Scorch and Hensel, um, because uh, I think a thing that we should also kind of mention uh, mm -hmm. alongside Scorch is what they did to Igni. Yeah. Because they're basically ruining Scorch effects completely, uh, mainly because one, two leaders were uh, had had full reign on kind of abusing them. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess you can consider Woodland too with artifacts, but that was the artifact thing, and you're working on nerfing them. So right. I I wish they would have just torn apart both of these like they're completely just garbage now <laughs> like igni at 20 and then scorch now at 14 provisions it's um it's very sad to see both of those go because i i was i played a ton of those cards yeah um i mean i definitely have had my periods of time where i just absolutely loved or didn't really like Geralt igni but i think that this one the reason why this one feels so bad i think Geralt igni is when you're playing around igni there was, like, in round one, I guess, specifically, like, the long round you can kind of count on. You kind of know, you know, your opponent's going to play into it. And if your opponent plays, you know, enough, they will eventually get there so you can get some value out of Igni. At 20, I mean, round one usually starts to, you can usually expect round one to end around, like, when you have five, four cards left in your hand. At that point, I think you can still really play around the, unless you have row movement which, you know, is still around and you can still do it, but you have to like really commit to it. It's harder yeah, to play like around. Have to run the villain. Yeah. <laughs> villain Treadmouth? I'm sorry for If they run the villain, run villain Treadmouth? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You almost have to run the villain just to get oh, in the off these days. Yeah, exactly. Like it's... Yeah, it's just, um, it's, it feels like it's easier to play around with. So in, including it in your deck, you basically need to have something else that makes it work. And, you know, Geralt Igni, uh, you know, it's no Scorch, but it's still it's still 12 provision points to put into your deck. And I feel like another, this is kind of like a larger thing that I'm I, I just kind of thinking about right now, but a lot of the high provision point cards require other cards to make them really good. Like the main ones for me are like the tutors. Meadow Cohorn, Kira, Metz, uh, Ermion, you know, the, the tutors for each faction. The cards are like 10 provisions each for two strength on the body for a tutoring effect. And I always feel like I'd rather just put in like so many other things than the tutor uh, to get it. I feel like I'm not seeing a lot of the tutors unless there's like a really specific like combo. But I feel like it's just almost not worth it. And I feel like these cards that are, they're already so expensive and now I have to put in something else. So now like if I want to run Kira, now I have to like commit to running three spells or, you know, potentially get bricks um, or something like that. So, I mean, I just feel like the high provision cards really are, they push the limit of, of worth, especially with Scorch now, but especially with Igni now. Just thoughts. Just just thoughts that I have on the whole thing. And then the last big neutral change is Wolfsbane being uh, all units instead of just your own side. Just killing the card, really. I mean, more or less, right? Like, you just, it's just not a powerhouse card anymore. Plus, they made it more expensive for some reason. I don't think I've seen it, period. And I don't expect to ever see it again unless it's, unless someone wants to get really memey in like a, a no unit deck. Mm hmm. Um, but yeah, the I, True, I don't know. Yeah, how I, feel I guess I guess I guess in some control matchups, I mean, you could say like because Forktail was so good because you know even if you didn't, even if you lost points, you still were hurting your opponent more. So I guess yeah, in that in the in a world in a world 
like a movie trailer in a world where the the uh the, you're playing a unitless deck much like many of these decks have already kind of like this you could still make a fairly low unit artifact control deck so it could still be a thing we'll find out a lot of other provision costs that we could probably expand upon if this was a longer podcast but i wanted to just uh generally though it's just making things a bit more attractive like elf and onion soup which is a card that actually fixes the problem i was saying before these high provision point cards that have little impact themselves but just help deck utility at least i can use take my kira mets and my dandelion poet and convert it into uh, uh something else for a lower cost you know if i'm thinking about memeing but most of this like stuff the, just making it a bit more attractive yeah i'd like i'd like you know those flavor cards to be a little bit lower costed because i mean they're obviously not going to be yeah they're not going to get you disgusting value unless you insanely high roll but they're fun cards to play and it'd be cool to see more of those yeah but I do like the idea of um, it, like like from season to season. How do you feel about the idea of knowing that every season you're going to see like twenty tweaks, provisions like only, otherwise fundamentally unchanged stuff, but just based on play rates. Let's let's even say that there is just always data behind the choice, and you just see like subtle tweaks here and there based on cards just that really really high play rates. Um, I mobas do this a lot. It's definitely not traditionally a card game thing because usually when you print the card that's it hearthstone stood by that for a really long time not nerfing cards seems like artifacts all about never nerfing cards too gwen has definitely not been on that wavelength no card has ever stayed the, stayed the same except for scorch but i mean just maybe keeping a meta fresh and maybe keeping things uh, we're gonna have an expansion we're gonna get content new cards that's gonna change the meta too but it's possible that maybe uh, subtle provision changes uh, season by season could keep things fresh. I don't know if you have an opinion on that one. Yeah, I actually, uh, well, so I have a, I like it and I don't, um, but that only, de uh, my not liking it only really depends on uh, how it is determined, like the play rates of the cards. If they're just sure. determining play rates based on factions, like which is how I felt like what they did with Damn Sorceress, like I feel like that's how that, I mean, we talk about that with NR. Yeah. But I mean, like I, I, talk, I can mention a bunch of other cards that they did this with too. But with pl just because they're played in a faction doesn't mean they deserve a nerf, right? Um, I just hope they don't go that route where they just, just because it's played a lot in a faction, it's not um, that they decide to nerf it. I was just thinking about potentially like if they wanted to maybe spice things i think it would be more spicy for them to make uh, underplayed cards more attractive rather than bring bringing down like you know because that's that's where you can open up like new interesting combos and actually see meta shifts as opposed to just people kind of you know just saying okay well i guess i can't play this super sweet card anymore what's next um because that yeah. is kind of like how the spike looks at it the spiky the you know the competitive player just kind of like, all right, what's going to take this spot that's going to give me as much of value as this? You know, you see this a lot in card games that have uh, card rotations. You know, oh, this card's rotating out, so how can I replace that in the deck and make it work? Well, and I feel like I feel like some decks, it's kind of like, okay, what low provision card can I put in that I'm just going to mulligan away? Yeah. <laughs> like, and sometimes it's, it just gets, gets, gets to that point. And, yeah. Uh... I mean, it's interesting. You can look at it like... Yeah, you know, you're always going to have, like, your wolf pack, I guess. Like, you know, if I get it, <laughs> eh, at least it's a ping. Maybe I can maybe I can get something out of it. But, you know, you just... I feel like four provisions, four recruit cost could be... It could be a much more exciting kind of bin of toys, I think. Like, I feel like we're looking for... Like that's where deck utility. Like the, uh, I feel like the seat, like the siege, the siege support. Uh, that's a great four provision cost card because it's really helpful for a machine deck. Generally helpful for the faction, um, and well, that's it. Those are the two things, and it's cheap, and it's uh, you know the body is fair for what it can do. Two charges on a machine, so you know that could say you could actually get quite high value from siege support. But you don't really want to put it in your deck if you can't be sure you're always going to get that value out of it your opponent can remove the machines and then that becomes kind of a risky thing to play so like that's an example of a good four point provision card where i feel like the other ones are just getting priced out because they're just too good well yeah yeah and i, I don't want to talk about more in the nr but because i have a lot of different thoughts on, on mm -hmm. a lot of their four provision cards but yeah i think that i, I do really like the the whole uh 
proficient system and ch just changing values to get underplayed cards just a little bit more playtime. Mm -hmm. Though at some point, you got to realize that it's not just the provisions that'll get a card played. Sometimes you ha actually have to go in and like tweak the ability a little bit itself. Yeah, I mean, if there's an issue, I hope they always uh, look at it like super critically. But um, I think a lot of the times it's uh, I do like the general kind of philosophy that we do need time to be like 100 percent sure that this is like something that can't really be countered or can't find some sort of uh, counterplay, at least for most factions, uh, that kind of thing, because, you know, that's where that's where the competitive players really are forced to thrive because you know you'll have the competitive players that will just play the best thing because it's going to win the most and they're you know, really really good so you have to be on the other side that if you just don't want to play those decks you, or you know you're going to run into them that you have to just figure it out one way or another um so one of the big ones are big woodland so let's talk about monsters um the big ones, I think, uh, speaking of Big Woodland, it doesn't seem like a lot of things were even changed that would even affect Big Woodland. I would say that the only thing is probably Forktail, and I guess Alpha Werewolf, if you would even argue that that's a, it's barely a change, you're going to thrive that baby up at least once, once probably. Yeah, I don't even consider that a nerf, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really... So, I mean, Aridin having... A, so, Aridin's boost goes down by... It's not really the boost amount, though, is it? Really, it's the immunity is is really the selling factor on Aridin. So yeah, like, it could just it could not give me a boost at all, and I wouldn't care. Yeah, just give him unit. Honestly, immunity. It, it plays around Scorch better now. It's true. Yeah, it's like, do I really want to commit the four points? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of a the appearance of a nerf. Erica's queen getting another mulligan. Boy, oh boy. I mean, I'll I'll tell you, as someone who tried to make Hensel work, and I'm sure you also did. Two mulligans still feels real bad <laughs> two, mul yeah. two if you need to use one of them in the first round it's it just it, you want to save them as long as possible at all times i feel like well and then you just got the you, <laughs> you got the thing where you just draw into the bronze you just mulligan oh yeah and the no yeah. blacklisting is yeah you want two swaps i, I still so. have faith they'll bring that back i think they'll listen and because a lot of the community is kind of asking for it but because then these then these one or two mulligan leaders won't feel nearly as bad right yeah, I mean, we're also coming from a world where the Witchers were, like, the card, right? Like, so if you, like, if I wanted to play Hensel, I have two Mulligans and I draw three Witchers. It's like, okay, yeah. well, if I draw my Hensel target, I'm, I'm done. And I absolutely can't play Roach, like, realistically. Like, it's just really hard to go into round three with no, like, even if you get your hand, you go into round three with no Mulligans, there's your Wolfpack. And, uh, and then it just feels bad when you lose by a couple points, even though you got your card. So it's, it's just, I mean... It's just, I think the blacklisting should come back, but I also think that two swaps is never going to feel good, and I would love to be convinced otherwise. Yeah, I, I, I kind of want to wait and see, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, cards like the Witchers, and uh, again, it, it, it all comes back to the you know the higher card pool um, mm -hmm. thing for me, whereas I'm probably not going to have too many opinions on changes in these things till we see more cards because you know some of these factions or some of these decks maybe it just needs a, a like higher tempo a couple higher tempo plays in the deck because i think with arrakis queen is you have so many you have so many engines and low tempo plays that like it's, it's hard saving mulligans and it's hard because you need to you need to find those certain cards. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Pro Professor Murdoch is making a point in the chat, also saying that uh, now that the Witchers are not, I mean, you're saying, I mean, it's you still see the card a ton, but you don't have to fight against that twelve point Witcher play anymore. You have to fight against the nine point Witcher yeah. play, which is a little less scary when you have. Let's say you're Erica's queen. You're not running Witchers. You've got a bunch of combo pieces because you know your entire. It seems like the entire deck is built around finding your combo pieces and your one strength units that you can kill on your side. But knowing that you don't need the tempo to beat the 12 point Witchers and also knowing that you can probably get away with not running the Witchers, I guess it makes it feel a little bit better. I think I probably should try that one before I really subscribe to saying that Erica's Queen feels super bad because at least hence out, you know, you get some cool games with two mulligans and Witchers sometimes. So we'll have to see, I guess. But otherwise, these these nerfs, I mean, the nerfs are really strength based, or uh, strength based, or uh, recruit cost based. Fundamentally, monsters didn't change. 
except for this wild hunt warrior which was a buff but i got buffed because it now qualifies the all units you control as opposed to on the row i think is what it used to say so it's just straight up um slight shifts fundamentally monsters no big deal big woodland looking pretty strong how do you feel about how they approach monsters here and how do you feel about big woodland in the meta at the moment um i don't know i i, I historically have not had a big problem with uh, <laughs> a little bit of a pun there big problem with big woodland um I, I i just always like i build my decks to counter the meta right mm -hmm. like if, if there's a lot of big woodland being played then i kind of switch my deck to a more control-based deck that deals with dream strength mm. um i think that's what more people should start doing instead of just like if you want to win the games like there, there's a difference between wanting to win your games right and then wanting to you know just go and have fun with a certain deck and you know um i think wild hunt so, warriors buff definitely just helps you have a bit more fun if you want to play all wild hunt at least you know you're probably gonna yeah I, I honestly i wish wild hunt was i wish there was more cards for wild hunt i'd love to i tried to look at the cards early on and see how i can make a wild hunt deck work but it, it doesn't look good <laughs> it doesn't I mean, look it's, good it's not i mean i feel like a lot of the stuff like wild hunt as it's like a theme they all care about like the the highest unit so like they kind of do have like the theme but i feel like most of the time monsters just wants to play the big units anyway you're seeing you're seeing eridan on emlareth you're seeing big woodland you're seeing you know with a uh, weavis and goliad and spear tip and ghouls etc azrael so you do see like a ton of that monsters just kind of want to play that way anyway and Wild Hunt, I feel like it's they're kind of just sort of like Wild Hunt Howard is just showing up because there's a slot for it. And you're probably going to have the highest highest unit as well. Monsters are just I mean, kind of doing it anyway. Yeah. When you think about it, like thematically and lore wise, though, like monsters being the biggest things on the battlefield. Right. Yeah, like, I do like it. I kind of like that. I do um, like that. They're either the biggest things or they're the swarmiest. Yeah. They're the small and swarmy or they're really big. And I kind of like that, that they kind of have that. They got Identity. That right. Yeah, they got that right, I think. For sure. Um, Quill, how are you doing on time? Because we are, we are, I mean, I, I don't think they're going to spend like another million years on this because most of these things are just kind of general provisions uh, and strength costs, but we are already at seven. So I just want to like just check real quick with you how you're, uh, how you're doing. Yeah, I, I can stay for as long as you want. Okay, cool. So uh, midnight. All right, awesome. <laughs> so let's talk about um, but let's talk about Skellige though. So Skellige had this cool thing where, well, I guess the uncool thing of having one less card, but the cool thing of getting like the latest reveal in a new card, Hemdall. So we have a, a the only new card that was added to the game is Skellige to balance out the collection. Now all cards have the same amount. Skellige not pushing any high provision co or high recruit cost borders as they, I think they all top out at. Oh, well, Wild Boar I got got boosted up to 11. But Hemdal is coming in as a new warrior, a new human warrior, which is important for Skellige because they have a lot of things that care about warriors and uh, resurrecting of those warriors. Nine strength, uh, sorry, four strength, nine recruit cost human warrior with the effect of when it is on a melee row, the melee row, uh, whenever an allied warrior damages an enemy, boost self by the damaged amount. So the dream combo is... Est plays Hemdal and Hjalmar in the same turn, banishing Yetta from the graveyard, and there's something on the board that you can hit for 12, 31 points. Boom. Now, in application, it's probably... You're, that That's the dreamland, right? Probably you're not getting 31 points every time you play this card, or if you're even playing an Est deck. How do you, What do you feel about like the, the competitive uh, viability of this card, Hemdal? Oh, it seems like... I mean, it's really early on to say... But I've seen some people making some pretty solid decks with him. Mm -hmm. And I really like that Hemdall's given rise to ice decks because before we would never really see ice, mm -hmm. you know, outside of just like Bear Boys, which didn't exist because of Savior and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I mean, 31's a lot of points, though. Yeah. 31's a lot of points. And this is kind of what someone in my chat kind of mentioned too that um, it just almost feels like another dagger in a way where it's just this mm. big finisher play that just kind of you save your leader for and you just get this big boy play as long as they have stuff provided that they have units on their board that kind of facilitates it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can make the argument that Harold and Esther are kind of both the same in that respect that, you know, I mean, most leaders, I think that have like the single use, they're playing for the big play. They're playing for the big play. That's either going to, that's going to decide around three or that's going to get bled out before they want to play it because they have no other choice to play it. Um, I do think that 
yeah does it, it does it it's you know same provision point slot it's the same it's the same slot it's uh it is close to the same i suppose yeah it's really close and the 31 points is not super unrealistic because if you do have last say on a, a deck like big woodland you will have the uh the meat to dig into that you would need uh for uh what is it to get to get that value from it so it's not you know completely out there it's not completely out there um so yeah so they got the new card that's pretty cool and then they had some pricing things so savage bear you know being just an awesome four drop frequently getting six uh, unlike the uh the siege the siege support that i talked about earlier um savage bear had almost no problem getting that value um lippy going up to 10 definitely affects the definitely affects lippy decks how much do you think that this really hurts, though? Lippy was, I feel like Lippy was not always the, what you needed for Croc to be really good. Let's say, yeah, yeah um, Lippy was definitely really, really strong um, mm -hmm. with the Witchers. Um, I think along with the provisional nerf, you gotta you gotta look at that the the Witcher nerf kind of kind of is a nerf to him a bit too. So he kind of got two nerfs there. Um, I mean, is he gonna be? played in like the top skeleton decks i don't think so um but i mean there's maybe he just needs the right different deck at this point um because i think the the wild boar decks work yeah i think the wild boar deck still works just fine mm -hmm. um without him yeah um it, it never necessarily needed him but it did benefit from him wild boar also getting the double nerf the power change and the recruit cost change i think skeleton just had a lot of ways of just putting in just a ton of good stuff in their deck so it looks like a lot of the changes were really about that and then drummond's queen's guards drummond's queen guard being the standout kind of i mean maybe you were seeing this at a high level i wasn't seeing a ton of this card but maybe just being safe with a duplication effect perhaps i'm not sure why uh why uh, hey. queen's guard got it there I never saw that card really. Yeah, it was. Gonna, there's uh, a couple of the, cards on this list that were eyebrow raisers, I would say. Yeah, that's definitely one of them where it's like I don't know. Maybe they thought because the of, of the nerfs that they brought that people would be going more for. Maybe they were trying to bring out that self wound Skellige, or I don't know. Maybe they were planning for the future, but hmm. yeah, that doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. I guess in a world where you are making one archetype superior by nerfing another one, you and then you're and then you're like helping it with control nerfs. Maybe they thought because of control nerfs it would be bring more of a chance yeah. for it, but uh... like a pre price out just in case. I mean, the six to seven is just an interesting slot to go up on because the six strength bron or the six recruit cost bronzes tended to be like pretty decent because the ones that you'd play, I should say. So Queensguard was already at six and not seeing play. That's the thing. Like Blue Stripe Commando yeah. and even old reinforced, like reinforced trebuchet is one of my favorite changes. We'll get into other realms real soon, but like reinforced trebuchet, I was already like playing it in some decks at six. Um, the bomber was seeing play at six, the double set of bomber. So like there were a couple of six, uh, six strength bronzes that were super good um so just that that particular price uh, cost change and then i guess the last thing for skelly the big one gremis no longer being a deploy effect this is uh this is a heavy one this is a heavy nerf to this card oh, yeah. so now he's a two point card eh, it was really about his ability which also got you know probably probably the biggest nerf you can get going from deploy slash zeal uh, going from fast to incredibly slow, especially well outside of Northern Realms where you can't apply zeal in many different ways. So in a in a in a situation where Petri's filter is your only hope, how do you feel about Gremist in a world that can't get a deploy effect? Uh, I don't feel like that world exists, honestly. I, Gremist, um, he wasn't seeing much play because the ale, like the ale is the really the only card you want to go for with mm -hmm. him, and that it's so expensive now. Not to mention all this nerf, like. I just can't ever see a world where, uh, unless they again add more cards, that he's really, you know, played. Because you look at all the other bronze alchemy cards, you get like Crow's Eye, you got uh, Demeritum Bombs and Shackles. Mm -hmm. It's like it's those are not emotion. something you're gonna wanna spend a Gremist on. Yeah, it really was. It was almost like I feel like this this nerf almost. I feel like there's a there's a timestamp on this nerf because Croc. Croc rose to power, right? Like there are so many different, like Croc, uh, Croc with spear, without spear, uh, uh, lippy, non-lippy tempo. Like Croc was doing pretty good. Gremist kind of just was a, 
I mean, we remember Gremis being six points, being able to have that ability at three strength was very, very good when Ale was nine, for sure. Ale got changed and Croc came out of, came out, like, just kind of rose to power right there. I feel like this is just, it feels like there is just a little dated. I'm not sure. And then, you know, there were some other changes here. But the big one, Gremis being, it's a strong effect. I mean, you could say that the design space was scary with a card like this, kind of oh, like yeah. old Ithlin, right? Like, hmm, can yeah, we... yeah, I definitely thought like I was I was calling for a Gremis nerf back when Ale was the Ale heavy meta, but now there's no reason to. Like you've already changed. I, I mean, for the future, like this nerf might make sense, hmm. and he just kind of they, they make him similar to Hatori, and but yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, yeah, Hatori did a did a similar a similar thing with artifacts, but was. I mean, you'd see him try to get protected sometimes, running the Thunderbolts and such. Yeah, they normally get the they run the they run the Petri's filter for him, but mm -hmm. yeah. So Northern Realms. Now you're a big Northern Realms fan. I am as well. Uh, so I was waiting for the big changes for Northern Realms, and I think that these lists of changes are not exactly what I anticipated, but not wholly unwelcome. Um, the main ones being the uh, leaders full test and Henselt now aligned at three mulligans. So what king will reign supreme? I think that they definitely play different decks. Full test with a lot of uh, very clear cards that work with full test. Whereas Henselt, you know, you, because you can react immediately when you play the card, you can get away with one very specific card, but you probably need two for draws. How do you feel about Henselt lately? I've been I've been giving it a little bit of a try, but how do you feel? Henselt at three mulligans. Honestly, I think he's a solid leader. I think you just need, I think uh, someone out there is just going to find the right way to play Henselt mm -hmm. and he's going to take off in, in popularity. I think people, if they don't think he's a good leader, they're kind of sleeping on him. I mean, it, uh, trying to get a, you have a 20 point finisher just with Kedwenny Knights. Yeah. I mean, he plays more for his bronzes. Uh, like it's, it's a deck you actually want to play like five point bronzes in whereas every other faction wants to just stuff a bunch of four point four point provision bronzes in. it's one of those decks where you want to play a bunch of fives and you want to play a couple high provision golds and at least that's in my experience yeah and then you know you just always have a hensel target that's strong yeah, I mean, and he he invites. He's like, yeah, you just don't you just want to play Vernon Roach with this deck? You put the Kedwenny Knights in there, and then you know if you don't hit the knight, Vernon's pulling the knights out for you. You're 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 doubling up on your reinforced trebuchet. You're getting you know two Kedwenny Revenants on the board at the exact same time, where your opponent can only answer one of them. Uh, like I just I've really enjoyed Henselt, and having three Mulligans just makes me feel like I'm not. And I'll be honest, I don't know if I have bad luck or if they put some malicious code into the witchers but man oh man i just tried to play hands up with witchers and i still feel like i have to use three of these damn mulligans like immediately yeah i'm, Shit, I'm doing I'm the just same so sick of the witchers i just don't <laughs> i think i just if if I, i'm just i'm going to use those 21 provision points for something else there's got to be something better there's got to be yeah I, like I, like i said i want to get rid of them too yeah. but so I tried, and the thinning means so much for the Hensalt. Like, I needed to get... I tried. I really wanted to. Yeah. But there's just nothing else to put in. There's no other way to get thinning. Uh, yeah. It's just... Um, and then we see the nerfs, the Northern Realm nerfs. So this definitely is... Uh... This is definitely feels like some 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 playing it safe, like some fail-safe nerfs, because Northern Realms was coming out of a meta where they were getting just beat up really bad i think they just you know in a control meta where you have almost all your units that can get you the the more extreme value that another faction's four or five uh, recruit cost units can get you are removable before you can actually use them unless you're full test but you really want to use those in golds anyway so i feel like i wasn't expecting there to be a lot of nerfs but i was there i was expecting there to be some foresight that northern realms would just uh indirectly get better if uh, other factions which were strong got worse um but what then i see the stennis nerf and i just mm -hmm. don't understand this one i don't want to like dwell too much on this one but this one sticks out to me even damn sorceress i can get behind for consistency because it seemed like they wanted to put the reach on these four on the reach on these pings specifically to kind of line up with how dwarven skirmisher and uh spear maiden spear maiden and... yeah spear maiden was the other one were already functioning but I mean, damn sorceress being Northern Realms like few solid units was kind of a bummer. yeah. 
I don't get how a sorceress wants to go into the melee row on a battlefield either, but yeah. hey, that's just me. I mean, Dance Horses is still good uh, because things end up on the well, melee row all the time, and it's a good unit for Kabuni Revenant. And it's... Well, they're good. They're good. They're still good, and you'll get the reach because of Trebs. Yeah. It's either play around Trebs or play around Sorcerers. Exactly. Like, you kind of give them a choice. So, exactly. like, the nerf isn't terrible but like you're still gonna run them obviously they're one of the, the best bronzes the best four point bronzes in our hands that you just throw in any deck but at the same time like that does hurt mm -hmm. in a lot of situations yeah but the stennis i mean the stennis one was uh like you look at stennis so stennis five is nine provision point card five strength and you can and gives boost the unit by two and gives two charges to that unit. Is any unit that can accept charges? I believe it's not machine based. So, and you can you can say that on the high end, a charge is worth two. Or not. Like you're probably giving this to a uh, giving this to a reinforced ballista, or on the highest end, you're giving it to full test pride, which I feel like is the only thing that would be the point of concern here. So, like Keon, maybe or yeah, like it seems like at, in the best case scenario. I guess Stennis starts to touch like 13, 14 points, I guess, if uh, like Full Test Pride really gets like, you know, you get the you get the perfect board. Although I feel like Full Test Pride, if you're lining it up, you definitely are winning. You don't need – sometimes like yeah. – I've never had a situation where it's like, oh, if I only had one more charge of my like multi-charge Full Test Pride, like somehow I didn't get, a, get enough value out of it. Yeah, I just don't understand Stennis, period. Like he didn't seem like – I didn't see him at all. Yeah. I mean – Again, this makes me wonder if they're just doing these nerfs based on the people, the, the few people who were playing NR and just saying, hey, this is, these are the cards we found that were included a lot. I mean, for Sabrina, I got to say, the, the Sabrina, much like Wild Boar of the Sea, getting the double nerf, uh, but like really nerfed. Like her, her recruit class goes up, arguably six was a bargain, um, but the damage going down from three to two. Oh no, her recruit class goes down. She was at a seven. Oh, my mistake. My mistake. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know what? Okay. Let me just quickly reevaluate this. <laughs> Quell, what do you think about this one? While I just, I completely went into this with the wrong uh, mindset. Yeah. So. She's, well, so basically, uh, she's just a lacerate now. Yeah. Um, but that can get revenant value. Um, it does hurt her a lot. Um, she was really good. She's a really good. Card. Yeah, she was. I, I do do agree. She needed a nerf, but mm. it might have been a provisional nerf. Might have been a better idea for her, because just making her a lacerate. I don't know. Like I would have, I would have wanted to put her up closer to Dragon's Dream and just raised her provisional value. I don't know. I like the change. I'm like ah, six provisions. That's yeah, okay. like, six I mean... provisions is really easy just to toss into a deck. But at the same time, uh, I'd still I would I would almost put just put in the lacerate at that point. I mean, I think that like it's true you could just put the lacerate in, but then you can't play my favorite game in Gwent, and that's putting Sabrina on the trebuchet row, and just <laughs> just waiting for the trebuchet to maybe ping her that, that from does the very sound beginning. Like a fun game. From because Sabrina has been Sabrina in closed beta at one point was also a one point card that. Uh, had an effect when it went off uh, on your opponent's side of the board. And reinforced trebuchets also did the effect that they did. But it wasn't a row-based effect. It was any row. So the praying, the bless RNG, like, will my ping hit Sabrina was a much more, like, explosive moment. But it's still fun. Dude, trebs are, uh, trebs from old Gwent make me not want to run the new <laughs> the new trebs just because of how many times they've disaligned my scorches and how many, like, the new oh, ones still... Yeah. Can't play them the new ones RNG still messes with me, but the other day I got one to uh, to, there's like six cards the dude the guy had on a row, and there was a one strength king of beggars, and this was round one. I was just killing off all of his engines, and it just the one trebuchet pinged it, and then he just auto he just took out the took out the plug and, oh, <laughs> and no. just DC'd. Your opponent's connection has the game cannot continue. Yeah, I mean, you do get. I mean, I I've always loved reinforced trebuchets. They've always been my favorite card. Even like you know, and they've been good and bad in in various situ in various metas. So, uh, I think that they are good. I think at five provisions, this card is spectacular. I think yeah, that at six, just... it was playable. But, uh, but like you know, it was you had to make some real concessions. It's like, can I run blue stripe command? Well, and the thing was, is it was in the in the control meta. Running yeah. that card in the control meta at a six was really hard to do. Yeah. Now running in a less control meta makes it so much easier and it's probably one of the best cards in nr right yeah, now big fan i think this this change alone like just 
it it's doing something that northern realms needed and that was just have like better cards in the low provision point slot uh, yeah like and yeah you look at Nilfgaard's version of it right there's almost always gets its provisional value yeah. whereas at a six y- you don't often find that mm-hmm. yeah it's really good um and then one of the comments that i because one of the things that they told us early was that drag is going to get nerfed uh before mm-hmm. they showed any other stuff and a lot of people were like like are you kidding me are you nerfing northern realms <laughs> but man drag is such a good card drag is so good um i was even playing some renew builds for double drag and it wasn't wholly terrible all the time um because renew is a good card generally but you know now both of those cards are 13 point cards uh, on the recruit cost scale um i think that the decks that play drag are probably more or less okay um but you know they were playing some kind of some not so great humans here and there and i feel like when you nerf northern realms in some ways like and a stranger is uh more expensive and uh uh i mean i guess that was the big one and you know rivian pikemen are, are worse uh Ugh. yeah i don't like i don't think that nerf is necessary either but i guess it's just again you know you know if we're well, gonna attack our value... blasts, we're gonna have to hit this my average value on rivian pikemen was like just the four because i can almost never you know get the get the extra ones like if, it's just taking ones away from revenants most of the time yeah like i was running poor uh well, like it's the name of the card my friends poor fucking infantry i was running that card <laughs> i was running that card because just at the five slot i'm like well i get five points all the time so i'm just gonna play it mm-hmm. and it's a human and it's good against spear so i'll play poor infantry so now it's like when you look at uh uh, when you look at Pikeman at the same slot, it's just, you know, now I'm hoping to get one extra point when I was barely ever triggering it anyway. I just mm-hmm. didn't, I felt like it was a cool card having that kind of old, already subtly nerfed battering ram effect. And uh, it's just less interesting now. I guess there was a real worry that it was going to be too expensive or too good. Sorry, there's going to be two ways to make it work with Northern Realms being better. But generally, though, Dragon kind of humans, human full test. Um, or potentially other human decks with Draug got hit a little bit. And that was the strongest, one of the strongest ways to play Northern Realms, unless you maybe found something that you liked a little bit more, Quill. Yeah, um, I was mainly playing Draug uh, before the nerf, and that was like the only Northern Realms I really got to work. Um, I think the nerf on it doesn't affect them that much, because the way I found to kind of make up for that provision loss, and I even get an extra provision for it, is because of the nerf on Dao. And with that card being less good for artifact removal, mm-hmm. I actually like the nerf on Bomb Heaver, putting it down to a five. And it's not really, an, I don't consider that a nerf. Oh, did we miss putting that it at a five. In neutral, yeah, that's actually a big one. Yeah. yeah, like putting that down to five makes it way more playable as artifact removal to me. Mm-hmm. And it's also a human. Yeah, exactly. So then you can save the provision on the DAO in, your, in, your, uh, in, your, in our deck and just go put the Bomb Heaver in instead of the DAO because DAO is less good now at a six. And just put the the cheaper bomb here in now, and then you saved yourself a couple of provisions. Yeah, now it's almost like Dow is the luxury pick. I want to really hate on artifacts because, yeah, I mean the bomb heaver. I mean the bomb heaver being played at six was more about faction based artifact removal being not good, uh, except if you're Scoyatel. Scoyatel is good. Yeah, <laughs> Skellige especially if you are up against a deck that's playing no units and artifacts, getting that bloodthirst trigger was like impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, and for Northern Realms, your all your soldiers are like three point units that are getting removed anyway. So you can never keep a soldier on the board against an artifact deck. So it just felt like those cards were uh, unplayably bad. Uh, whereas the Squatel one was perfect. It just, I mean, it's arguably too good now this, when you compare it to the bomb heaver, because you're probably hitting that condition and monsters and Nilfgaard, uh, well, Monsters has has Nithril, of course, but yeah, Monsters has ar- arguably the best yeah, artifact removal in the game. It's just not bronze. Like Nithril is, it's just insanely good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's just like now, now that Bomb Heaver is in the five slot, it just seems like the faction based artifact removal is like just so so completely unattractive. Um, and I mean, I guess it's okay because this is the core set. You know, we learn how to evaluate things as we play. And boy, yeah, I think I think at this point, like 
Um, I, the final question, as you can maybe prepare, and maybe in the chat, I'd like to ask this to all of you as well. The final question I'll ask is, if the game did not change at all until the next time we got new cards, would you guys be cool with it? I know it's hard to say it after two days, but that, that's going to be like the kind of the final question that I'll be asking as we get through the last two factions here. Unless there was any last points you wanted to make on Northern Realms, because you are, uh, you are, uh, a, I, you'd say you're a predominantly or exclusively Northern Realms player. You play other stuff, right? Um, actually, I was last uh, the last patch. I was mainly monsters. Actually, that's oh, yeah. what I got my highest scores with. Um, and I was my second highest, but I played. More, I played more Nilfgaard, more Skell, and our section my least played on my top four. It's my most played and my worst MMR. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, well, I got I got my uh, 2570 and I just left. Oh yeah, the pro the uh, the the pro rank. Yeah, MMR. Well, once the once the because I I did really well during the ale season. Yeah, like using Drog and Igni, I just got like 40 point Ignis every game. But once ale ended and control fully took over, I could basically not play NR anymore. I actually did okay. Like when I like my peak on I'm in I'm in pleb rank though, but my peak on uh, on Northern Realms was not was not so shabby. Uh, I did end up. I mean, I did end up like in when the leaderboards were closed. I think I was still like 300 global just based on my scores. But um, I definitely got that peak, which was my lowest MMR out of the four factions. But I got the peak when like the meta was very unsure. Like the first thing I did it was play all my Northern Realms games like on the first two days of Homecoming before anything yep. was kind of figured out and full test was like super good oh, i loved it you got selkirk prize winning cow which uh, i mean it's okay but i definitely played it in that time and uh and Aquas were just like three solid things and it seemed like it was going to be okay for northern realms and then ethna showed up yep <laughs> so let's talk about squatel i guess so squatel uh, uh squatel saw some changes as well and they definitely didn't see some changes um and I've been told that so, I, well, let's just well let's talk about the let's talk about some of the good stuff. So, uh, well, Phil Vandrell had four mulligans, which was a ton. So he got he got hurt a little bit. Ethna got the big change. So we'll talk about the Ethna change. So no longer do we live in a world where Ethna can ping you for three every single round. We live in a world where Ethna can ping you for four whenever she wants, but only for four. This is a huge change for Ethna. I think she's still good. What do you think about her? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think she's still playable. She's a yeah. uh, she, she's a lot more like harder to use in terms. Of, you can't really got to think out your pings and plan it out mm -hmm. and realize what you're uh, what you're drawing into. And again, with the, with the seeing your deck and stuff, remembering what cards you still have left mm -hmm. and how you use your pings, I think it'll take uh, I think it'll take a lot more thought for you to actually to to get the value. And I, I like that about it. You know, I I felt like. It was a good change. I mean, a lot of people said she's nerfed to oblivion. You can't play her anymore. I, th I think she's still playable. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, it's gonna be harder without Igni, and you got to try and fit in like Scorch. So I, I assume you'd stick to more professional and other cards like that that benefit rather than the more expensive ones. But I think she's, I think she'd still be all right. I find Ethna Ethna is a really interesting leader in that she is a leader now that has, uh, she has charges for the entire round. But I feel like she still plays very much like a single use leader in that when you're using your charges, you're likely using them like with grand purpose. But that may not be as your final play. It probably could be, but it may not be. But then once you use those charges, your remaining charges are just kind of like just leftover points that you just kind of have in the bank because you didn't need them for your huge Scorch or your huge Shiro or more likely Shiro because Scorch is 14 provisions. But you are using her at for one big moment as opposed to what she yeah. could do before, which were just like multiple big moments all the time, <laughs> destroying your board and making everything perfect all the time for, for Scorching and Ignis and for uh, Shiro. So now it feels like, you know, it's like kind of like Aridin. You're playing, you're playing around and to push out that very, very scary immunity. You're yeah. trying to push same out that Same thing scary... with Ice, the yeah. same thing with Daryl too. Yeah, yeah, she just feels like another one of those. Mm-hmm. Which, but different. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that because, like, it it seems like they're trying to give each faction a couple leaders that are just like that, where you're just gonna want to bleed them, right? Like, mm -hmm. it it just feels like they're gonna give you a one long round leader, and then leaders where you just get bled, mm -hmm. and then just one whatever leader, one one that's just consistent in the middle ground. Yeah, like I like yeah. We have your you have your slow leaders, which are like demavend. 
probably the slowest. And then you have your fast yeah. leaders, which is like Harold or Ada, I guess, where it's just like, boom, everything's right there in one in one clean go. And then you have your passive leaders, which I think have the potential to be the most interesting, but it seems like it seems like CDPR is like the most scared of them just kind of based on how they've approached uh, mulligans for Usurper, which is arguably like so unique of an effect. It's hard to say that he represents passive leaders, but uh, Erica's queen definitely does. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm, yeah. I, yeah. I will we'll talk about how I feel about Usurper when, uh, <laughs> yes. when we get to know her. Yes. The, uh, the fears of the world coming true. Usurper has a mulligan. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, but I mean, a lot of the big changes we saw are generally strength tweaks um, or provision cost tweaks to Scoitel because they had such great selection of bronzes that could remove things. You had your panther, which could ping for three. Your officer could ping for three. Your bowman could ping. And ethnic could get, I mean, and also ethnic could polish up anything that these things couldn't do, um, which ethna is less likely to be doing now because she has six less uh, opportunity or what is it five less opportunities to do it um so it's mostly nerfs uh sheldon skaggs got buffed uh gabor got buffed gabor is a good card anyway so i think that's a pretty cool buff um and it seems like more tribal stuff was pushed um stuff like uh uh, more more archetypal stuff and tribal stuff, right? You're seeing dwarves get a little love. You're seeing uh, buffs getting into like half-elf hunter here where like this supports more of an artifact build. Milena having zeal supports more of a movement-based build. And all the nerfs hit the cards that were just kind of proving to be just too many of a good thing. Panthers, Officer, uh, Blue Mountain Elite. I love that you can play around Blue Mountain Elite. That's for sure. How do you feel about these nerfs to Squatel? Or these changes to Squatel? Cool. I mean... There's quite a few to go over there. Yeah. Um, I mean, th th there's a couple that I agree with, and there's obviously a couple I disagree with. Like, it, as much as I didn't like the control from Squiatel, I mean, Blue Mountain Elite, like, I don't know exactly what they were thinking, right? Given that, given those two conditions for it, I mean, mm. that, that card's. Oh, the fact that so it has two conditions now, yeah. Yeah, it's so unbelievably bad. And just you, you, now you don't even have to play around that because before you would have to, you'd have so. And I mean, you would have so many things you need to play around with Scoia'tael row-wise, right? You need to play around having multiple units on a row, like you want to try and play multiple units on a row. Then you want to have to play around Blathana Bowman, mm -hmm. and you want to play around Bomber. So typically you'd go and play him on the front row. But then you also... then that was also playing into yeah. um, the Dwarf with one reach. Like, there's just so many things where it's just like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I think some of these nerfs make it a little bit easier. Um for play and mm. to play around cards that they could potentially have. Um. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the double condition, it's almost like they either need to make blue mountain elite better, like give the ping, make the ping five or something, which seems ridiculous for a four recruit cost unit. But also the fact that it just seems, it doesn't seem, it seems worse than the cards that are just uh, ping for three unconditionally. Like, damn sorceress yeah. is better than this card now. And and I think mainly, I mean, it's possible that they just wanted to take this card. Just, you know, Squaytail has so much stuff at the bottom of the uh, the spectrum there for recruit cost. Let's just take, like, just one just out of the argument completely. So Blue Mountain Elite taken out. The Bowman, uh, the Bowman was a big one. So, but I mean, she her effect is real. It was the, it was the ping thresholds that were very customizable. So that really was only, like, hurt in panther which is that's a bad card at six isn't it and uh and the uh the uh the officer which is not a bad card at six i think between the two of them yeah i don't know i kind of like the the rise of the dwarfs that are happening right now mm -hmm. um as much as i hate to say that from the previous history in gwent um it's interesting to see them come back into play um as much as i'm not typically a fan of all the carryover stuff it's cool to see cards like sheldon skaggs and squatel getting a finisher that's less about just complete annihilation of a board with shiru mm -hmm. i like to see that they're kind of stepping away from shiru and scorches a little bit and going into other win conditions is something i really like to see yeah it seems like um we can definitely yeah shiru is like the last thing i wanted to touch on um oh i just lost my train of thought i had a really good follow-up here it wasn't about door. Oh yeah, what I was gonna say is because you're saying, um, you were saying it's it's hard to say that you're happy to see dwarves 
power being powerful because of you know what that means you know the trauma the 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 ptsd and that's just mm -hmm. you know it's just words <laughs> though because so much of stuff changes it's just words that just they mean different things and that's kind of like the play on the title of this podcast midwinter's revenge because we had that bundle in the shop that's like the midwinter pack it's like whoa they used the word midwinter and people really didn't like the midwinter patch which a uh, happy anniversary to the midwinter patch by the way <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we're almost there. We're almost at a year of Midwinter Patch, and this is 2018's Midwinter Patch. So, you know, that's how it is. And dwarves maybe rising to power again. Oh, time flows like a river, like we said. And, he, and so Shiro not changing. Now, day one, it only took me to get it only took me getting Shiro once to set me off, really. And it wasn't even like yeah. I really wasn't running into a ton of them. I, I've, I've only seen, I haven't played a ton of games in my defense. I've only played about 30 or 40, I think, in the last couple days. I've been a little busy, but I've only seen Shiro like three times. I still feel like that card is really just like super, super strong. And I'm surprised with all of the changes that we've seen, highlights with the ones that make a ton of sense and the changes that don't immediately make sense like Stannis let's say that's going to be my my poster boy for the changes that I did not expect the fact that Shiro didn't see an adjustment of any kind at all I'm not saying he needed to be nerfed to oblivion I'm not saying that you know he needed to be that he was being played too much let's say but not even like a not even a whisper of a change surprised me Quill do you think the game is, is do you think it's just fine you think it's just maybe I'm I'm overreacting because I could be. No, I I really wanted to see it. I mean, it's not being... I haven't seen it being played mm -hmm. in a little bit, but that doesn't mean he won't come into prominence again when people just start to... like. I, so we, we don't really know if dwarfs are here to stay or not or yeah. if people are just experimenting and they'll just go away. Like We don't know what's good or not yet. And if it does just revert back to Shiru, then it's going to feel really bad, right? Because it could easily just do that. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to... Like the suggestions I've seen that I really liked was a deploy effect, Shiru, where you had to hand buff him to actually, you know, get that stuff out of him. And you have plenty of cards to, you know, go ahead and try and do the hand buffing with, or you just use call. Um, mm -hmm. So it would. All right, well, does call do the deploy effect? I don't even know. Call but... the forest does do it. Yes. Because I, I haven't played Scoia'tael, but I mean. I, I would have liked to seen something done with him because I don't want to see the the past repeat itself and just it's it's just Shiru time again. But yeah, um, it sucks getting Shiru, man. It just feels so when it just feels like how is this? Well, only when it's really bad though. I feel like if if like if I'm like you know if I'm in like the zone and I'm just playing around everything, you know, it's, it's I'm, I just happen to be able to play around Shiru in that moment, or I didn't have to use my resources to prevent some other crazy thing that Goytel was able to do. If it just worked out. But when you get, you know, Shira hits three sixes, it happens. It's just, ah, oh, it's just like it feels like super strong. Even if it didn't have yeah. to do that much to beat you, it still feels like, well, it doesn't matter what I could have possibly had. You would have been able to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And like I've spent whole games with Nilfgaard and those, uh, and like boosty dudes playing around it. And it, it was just, I, I still just lose. Mm. Like, yeah. You play around the Shiru, and then you play into well. Back then, it was Igni and Scorch or Professional, mm -hmm. but um, now that Igni's less prevalent, it you know might make it a little easier to play around him because then you have one less thing that you're playing into if you play around him. But um, and same with Wolfsbane, like that too would. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Wolfsbane thing. I mean, I think that. I think the challenge for CD Projekt Red was that they knew they made a card that had an interesting effect, a card that really makes you think ahead, a card that makes you plan, a card that you can plan your whole strategy around. Like, I, we should be encouraging and promoting cards like this. These are cards like, you know, I remember somebody saying that, like, playing Shiro felt like you were playing a Thronebreaker puzzle. I can't remember who said it. I wish I could credit the, the, this statement, but I felt like I was playing a Thronebreaker puzzle because I had to, like, you know, you had to figure out how to solve it so Shiro can completely destroy the board and that's how you would win um, but I feel like that is a little bit lost when the power level feels so high on that card uh, well and I feel like it's less of a puzzle when um, the units are so close in strength and you just have artifacts going off and multiple ethnic pings where you know like it, 
I, I feel like it's a lot of it's lost a lot of the at least interestingness because like uh, like I watch their side of the board and I'm like how are they going to solve this puzzle mm-hmm. and I'm like oh well uh, there they there they go they just have a spear to go and line everything up because I didn't have a full deck of artifact removal um, yeah even if they only so, need like a couple pings they yeah, yeah yeah I mean if they, if it's only the Ithme pings then yeah yeah then it's more like uh, trying to figure out what what gives you the best Shiro what. What numbers do you want to go after to give you the the highest value out of the card? Um, At least Athena's easier to push now because she doesn't have that guaranteed power in round two. So maybe it may just be yeah. more about treating her like we said before, like as a one as a leader that you need to bleed. You just need to see, you know, if you let Aridin go through with like an immune Gals for that kind of deck, it's like incredibly hard to beat it. I guess it's kind of the same idea. You can't. Before it was you. Before you just needed Lasse to have a hope against Athena, but now maybe if it's needing to secure the bleed i definitely need to get my hands on the patch a little bit more i feel like i uh i'm looking at this from a super to- hot top level because I've, I've poured over these patch notes i mean but that's quite tell rounded up really like shiro seeming very scary more or less um the the, the premium bronzes kind of I feel like Scoia'tael was given an assortment of bad cards, whereas other factions kind of got those already. Now it's like Scoia'tael's turn to have some <laughs> cards that are just not good. Um, more or Some more cards, I suppose. Um, and then there's Nilfgaard. So Nilfgaard, I guess the, the banner change being Morvran is no longer... Um, <laughs> I mean, Morvran was so good uh, before. Like being able to put three or four points uh, and protect and get a, and a trigger every single round. Like Morvran was arguably harder to push than Athena in the early like early round because he would just be able to like drop the Mangonel, boost it up, and then have an engine on the board that he can just use for the rest of the game. Now it is a three charge ability. He still reveals the card boosts uh, whatever ally by two, no matter what you reveal, three charges, that's it. Very much like Bruver now, Very feels more like Bruver. You get an effect that you probably have synergy with. You can do it three times. Uh, I mean, I think he was he was probably a little overtuned. I mean, it's hard because Morvran kind of went down in popularity, but I don't think it was because he wasn't amazing. How do you feel about the change to Morvran? Uh, I like it. I mean, the the whole. Uh, I mean, you can still go and save them, but it, it just makes them another leader. That, like you can bleed out again. Like I said, like they're trying to give. Uh, I don't know. He needed some sort of change, and changing it down to two, I think, was the biggest change for me, um, because giving him three to four points on a reveal is pretty disgusting. Yeah. Um, for sure. So now changing that to two is, I, I feel, a lot more fair for the card. Um, because he can still get, he can still be very good here, and I mean, you got to count up all the value he gets off the potential trebuchets, the Swears reveal value that he yeah. still gets. Like he still gets a lot more points than just you know those six points. So you got to add up all that other value as well. Yeah, it's true. I mean, Morvan's still very good, and if you wanted to play the reveal cards, like he still can get you a ton of value. Um, but. We were seeing so much more Vran, so I think that it's time for other leaders to step in. And Emmy are getting three uh, three swaps now, definitely makes him more playable. Um, and Yusuf are getting a swap back, you could say, because in the PTR, it was the alarm bells were on for Yusuf having, <laughs> like, Yusuf being in the game. First of all, it was like, this card is, I'm very scared this card's in the game. And then when the swap went down to zero, it's kind of like, well, the card's still in the game, but. I'm probably not going to see it very much, so it doesn't matter. So do we think that the one redraw in Usurper will bring him into enough relevance to really make people mad, or are we over it now that we've actually had a chance to, in the rare occasion, play against Usurper and feel like, you know, maybe it's not so bad, considering my opponent doesn't have reach either? Yeah, I hate to say it, but a lot of people are already bringing Usurper mm-hmm. right now. <laughs> that, 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 first, that, that first day or so was... Uh... Yeah, there's there's I've ran into a ton of usurper, just usurper lock complete shutdown, mm-hmm. um, because locks are now super prevalent in Nilfgaard, um, due to a lot of their bronze nerfs, and they just go with the whole usurper thing and uh, just shut down the opponent completely. Yeah. Poor Northern it's almost Realms. like <laughs> the control goes yeah. out, but lock comes right in. <laughs> yeah, I feel uh, like I I feel so bad for all the people pl- trying to play Demavand and just running <laughs> into that. Yeah. 
I mean, I definitely had, I had, I had handheld locked out. I mean, again, it wasn't a lot. It's probably about as many times as I got Shiro and I got Usurper when I was playing some handheld games. But um, I definitely saw him in the first day uh, twice, I think. And it was pretty good. I mean, it's, 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 it's troubling to think that, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like, I always said Usurper was a brave decision to put a card like that in the game. And I, I applauded it at first. And I also applauded their uh, keeping it in the game after the reaction for the first from the first PTR showcase. But, and we've seen how strong those single-use leaders can be. Like, Woodland is very, very strong. and uh, But, you know, you're able to bleed them. But the Usurper, you don't have to bleed them. You can just control. You're in a position of control as if you've used your ability already to get yourself that good position. And now you can play from there because, you know, your opponent doesn't have their leader ability as well. I feel like it hurts. It hurts everybody, but it hurts the single use leader the most, even more than Erica's Queen. Even I feel like it maybe puts Erica's Queen on an even playing field. Maybe not. The locks are a big deal. Um, anyway, that's my that's my that's my rambling on you, server. I think that I definitely need to see, I need to see more days of the patch before I st I think I can give a verdict on you, server. Yeah, I don't know. I just the only thing I don't like about it is I like to build decks that play around other leaders, and I guess funny enough, usurper would be the leader for me if I was. <laughs> but it, you, you can't really just go and build around usurper and his effects as a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and just, I, you I, like it or you don't. I just think, that, yeah, I just think it leads to boring situations for me. It's not necessarily that like I think it's broken or that it just it takes a lot of the fun that is the leaders for me out of the game. Mm -hmm. Like I think the leaders uh, as compared to like old Gwent is probably the most fun uh, I've had with the game is playing out the, the leader abilities. Yeah. So just taking those completely out of it just feels really bad because that's like my, mm. you know, my, the, the biggest selling point for me. A lot uh, card games traditionally have very polarizing cards, cards that some players really like and some players really don't like, or some players that are really good sometimes are not good. You know, there's also the range of RNG. Uh, I think that in a lot of cases, when a card is very polarizing, it's usually when it's played against you. When it's played against you, it's like, oh, it's that card. Like, Shiru is a polarizing card. I hate that card. I'm sure a lot of people think that, but I also at least can see the viewpoint why people might like that card because of the way you kind of, you know, play into the condition. But Usurper is not played against you. It's welcome to the game of Gwent. Your fun is already reduced by this much. Enjoy the game. It's not even like there's not a moment in that you feel bad. It's potentially the entire game. And if you lose that game, it's like you felt bad the whole game and now you lost. And even when you win, it's kind of like, oh, good. Oh, it's over. I won. Good. Like, it can move past it. So I feel like there's going to be a point where we're just either fed up with the card or it's never good enough to see. It's just, it's not binary. It's polarizing, but it's black and white, really. I think Usurper is just a card that we're always going to be talking about, but it's not always going to be a good conversation. I don't think it's ever going to be a good conversation. Yeah. Um, but the other stuff is uh, uh, some just pricing stuff. Again, Slave Infantry, uh, another one that went from six to seven, but boy, Slave Infantry was a good card. So that one is, I think it's fine. I think it just looks like more of a one of now with the change like this. And Deathwind Arbalest looks like Yeah, a I often write it as a one of to begin with in a lot of my Nilfgaard decks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's def, 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 definitely takes a hit there. Yeah, Deathwind Arbalest got hit pretty hard. Don't even think you run it anymore, personally. Um, but, yeah, it's only full reveal. I think that you would ever run it. I mean, it is it is getting you the extra reveal potentially, and it is it is good, especially when you combine that with like Fregaf and stuff like that to get the extra proc. So for sure, Swears would still do it, I guess, for that. Uh, Darlin Soldier, I kind of wish they just changed this card's effect. It's like one of my least favorite cards in the entire game uh, <laughs> because it's it feels like the, talk about Nilfgaard having cards that feel rotten to play with and against. Uh, you play this card and you don't draw, you don't reveal it and play it. It sucks. You draw it. It sucks. Your opponent gets it and plays it against you. It really sucks, especially if you were trying to make it work like the previous day. And it's like, ah, oh, of course this guy gets it. So it just feels like super, I just really hate Darling Foot Soldier. Recruits change is fair, I think. Swears change is fair. That card gets high, high value. And uh, yeah, I mean, those are the big, big pricing changes. I think False Siri just made more attractive. Yeah. It, it, it. 
at first I didn't think Squeers was uh, I thought it could be nerfed a bit more but since yeah, he's really Reveal good. has been hit pretty good with a lot of their Reveal cards just you know making it you less likely to want to play them mm -hmm. I mean I think it's I think it's close to it, it definitely needed some provisional nerf no that card was that card was often getting you know like getting up to 12 damage it didn't always hit that 12 damage but it was able to do 12 damage like every game yeah like it's 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 exactly it's kind of like looking at like the uh the dream the dream hemdal uh scenario yeah. which, which isn't more which isn't so much more insane than maybe something harold could do in one turn but it is kind of like you know if if there is something for me to hit this is going to be juicy uh, kind of thing and i Nilfgaard has a lot of that too with the ways that they might play uh the drain boosting uh kind of uh uh i think diplomacy is the what i've coined as that kind of Nilfgaardian knight sort of uh, uh rain farm type thing but yeah that kind of thing um and hefty helga make it made a little more attractive here on the power a card that i actually liked in the first place so that's kind of cool um i just wanted... I saw that for the first time just now like i've well, no, like on like yesterday, oh, the I, that was the first time I ever saw a Hefty Helga. Yeah, it's never immune, knew what it did. It's an immune card outside of Squirtel and monsters, so that's already notable. Also, if I could just quick go back, is just a little because I meant to touch on it in Squirtel at the end. Mm. I I don't know if you've ever been gnomed by a Squirtel player, but there's a gnome lurking around in Squirtel. Beckenbauer, <laughs> and I got gnomed on stream. I'd never seen the card before. Oh, like just a little, like a like got the uh, got the, like the your opponent just got the full twelve value from him. You're talking about Beckham. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. I've never seen him before. I was like, "What is this card? Is this a new card? Did this get shadow added into the game?" Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there isn't a lot of because the the I think that's that's again another the big culprit here is card pool. There are really not a lot of dryads to play. Uh, so cards like uh, Eisengrim's Council and Beckenbauer, just generally comparing them to other cards that you might use to make your deck better, feels like you have to make your deck potentially worse for them to work or potentially brickable or not as good. And also the the, uh, the recruit cost of, uh, of Eisengrim's Council is super high. Uh, but yeah, more, I mean, it's really Moran and Brienne. Brayen even cheekily has a two dryad condition to meet that she can only meet if Moran specifically is the only card that can be on the board to actually yeah, trigger that's her condition. Lot. So when they add more dryads, maybe that's probably going to be less surprising. But tribal stuff just didn't look very good right away. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Oh yeah, that's. Uh, so I'm just reading the. Ch I just want to shout out uh, Magus of the Moon talking about the re the recruit change. Recruit was fine. I don't think so. Was it? Do you think Recruit <laughs> was fine, Quill? I, I definitely think that I think he's, this is. I think one... he's trolling a bit there. Oh, is he trolling? <laughs> I don't see the cap, but just the mad face. That's all I see. So there's just. May, May just always has the has the angry going on there. Nilfgaard, Nilfgaard main found, spotted. Um, so there, there you have it. There's, there's your uh, not complete, complete, but fairly complete patch note review from Quill and McBeard. And if you want to check those patch notes out, um, I will put a link to the the official Gwent patch notes, um, which I will now currently be posting in the... Ch no, I'm not going to post it in the chat, but I will post it in the chat notes, uh, the patch notes. If you want to just follow along, and you probably would have benefited from that earlier, but it's always been there in the show notes if you're listening as an audio listener. So, Yeah. There's your patch notes. Any final closing statements before uh, we wrap this podcast up? Remember, I was gonna, I was gonna say, the big question I wanted to ask to everybody in the chat and to you, Quill, is that if the game, if there was no more balance until they added new cards, do we think two days in, hard to call, but do we think that this could be something that we could be fine with, keeping in mind that there is gonna be OP stuff, there's gonna be highly played stuff and OP stuff, but I mean, every card game, every meta is gonna have that. If the next shift in a meta was caused by new cards, would we be okay with that? Let's say like February. That's the question I'm asking the chat. And that's the question that I'm asking you, Quill, as well. And you can think about that as well, because I'm gonna just say, uh, we'll go into uh we'll go into uh we'll go into our community section because this is a question for all of you guys as well. So let's talk to the community and play that drop as well. And uh, wrap up a healthy podcast we've had.
once again, we are supported by our commandos. Commandos! Our patrons at patreon.com slash commanders horn. Thanks so much for all of your support, as always, throughout the years of Gwent as we are approaching. Oh, no, we're past. We're past the two year mark at this point. But, you know, it's been a fun time with all of you, of course. Uh, so we're talking about if the next balance change. And let's say let's say it was let's say it was f the end of February. Let's put like a healthy time. Let's put a healthy time on this meta. Actually, let's put let's say two months. Let's say two months from now. So you have we have this meta for two months, and then there's an expansion with new cards. That's the that's the hypothetical scenario we have. Because the first question, or the first comment that I that I wanted to point out was uh, SP Timbo, saying that it depends on the time frame because that is always a question when it comes to metas feeling stale, and usually metas start to feel stale when you see the same things a lot, or you see car, you see decks reign supreme a lot. So in metas that are very unbalanced it feels like much longer and much less fun to get to that next shift which i'm saying would be potentially caused by new cards so quill i'll leave, let you lead off new cards or balance what do you think is more important right now for gwent let's say in a two-month time frame um okay this is this is a really tough one for me that's fine it's supposed because... to be a tough question because I think a lot of new cards would do a lot for the game. You know, it would unbalance it at first when they're initially released, but at the same time, we have to throw in a bunch of garbage into decks just for the sole fact that we don't have enough we don't have enough cards for archetypes. And as a deck builder, that's my main thing in this game is deck building. So I would say for me, new cards, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um two months is another long while that I it'd be unfortunate, but at the same time if it gets it here faster, um, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, if I added if I added an additional part to the hypothetical scenario where this option did get the new cards faster, I think I mean that makes it that makes it clear for me. Like that would I feel like that that almost makes it a no brainer for me. Like if I anything to improve anything to uh, reduce the time frame for new content, um, because you know Hemdal's pretty sweet card, but I mean. New kind. I mean, it's it's the 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 weird thing is like because it feels like homecoming is so new in general, especially for the people who are just playing it. As of December fourth, it feels like everything is so new. How can you even be talking about new content? I'm just trying to need to relearn the whole game. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. I I know, and I I feel that as well. But because everything is always shifting, it's been it's felt like that. It's not the first time Gwen's felt like that before, and I definitely feel like I need a different feeling, and I think that feeling is stability, and I think that things changing because new cards are added. And I was also talking about how like you look at the the four slot and the five slot and you just look at all the things that are available. You open up the shelf, you know, there's some good snacks and then there's some bad snacks, but you got to eat everything. That's kind of the thing. But you also have to think about, you know, are they going to just make it so eventually there's going to be so many good things to put in the four slot and the five slot that there's similar problems that we just had where the four slot and the five slot was just getting too much value for some factions. How do you control that in the future? I mean, this is the stuff I don't envy about the design team where they yeah. have to approach this kind of stuff. Well, I'd rather have uh, I'd rather have the option of having, you know, yeah. not being able to decide between good choices than, you know, just trying to decide what's the least worst choice. You know what I mean? For it's, sure. It's, but therein um, lies the uh, therein lies the thing about the provision system in that if there are a lot of good choices in a slot, you can pick them all, and the lower they are, the more you can have. It's not like you're putting in like a four mana slot, which is definitely something you couldn't overload. And at the same time, like two months of just the same meta kind of does give you a little bit of stability for before that change too, because two months is still a good good bit of time as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's not any balance patches happening during it or not anything going on during it and it's kind of just like this whatever meta but at the same time you know that's enough that's enough of a lull for me to where i just want something new again i need something new i need that i got that i got that itch you know i'm, I'm i got that hunger for the new cards mm -hmm. yeah i mean the two month the, the reason why i said two months specifically as i'm going to go through what some of the people in the chat said um is that i felt like that what that that was specifically supposed to be like a long time to bear uh, I wanted to give gravity to the to the choice there, um, on that specifically. So uh, we have uh, 
Yeah, the game still has plenty of Professor Murdoch saying the game still has plenty to explore as uh, on the PC account, especially as he's uh, he was a console player that probably is just getting back into his OG account. Uh, Magus of the Moon saying two months feels like an entire year on my planet. Uh, Professor Murdoch also saying very happy with this hypothetical scenario as, as we're actually getting into me giving the uh, stipulations royalty balance seems fine right now but there are too many underwhelming cards that shouldn't be overlooked particularly since they're going to be ignored if new cards come i think that's probably fine that just happens in card games and i don't think there's any way to really avoid that you can't make every card good and appealing uh like in a perfect world you have like five archetypes you can play with each faction each archetype uses its own cards and those cards are all very good and None of those cards cross over, so you don't get any familiar. You don't get any feeling of staleness, and none of them are too strong neutrals either. Like you can't check every box. Every card game struggles with cards that are problematic for the player base because they hate them or they're too strong. And I think that two months is fairly reasonable in a game that's like going, like a game that's now has a content release schedule roadmap. When. It's definitely, I'm definitely looking forward to reporting on the roadmap, potentially in a future podcast this month. Um, uh, so, like, kind of kind of going along with mm-hmm. that, too. Um, I'm a big fan of, like, that old saying, you know, if you try and please everyone, you're going to please no one. And I think that applies to card games, too. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you got to have some stuff that only, if, that's only going to, you know, appeal to a, a certain group of people. I mean, that's that's why there's different things for deck building. That's mm. why people build different decks. That's why they like different play styles. There's always going to be a play style that's the, and a card and cards for that play style that someone will like and someone will hate, and someone will play those certain cards and pe- other people won't. So well, that's the thing um, about really that's the thing about cards that people hate that are also super strong and competitive. People will just play them. So if you don't like them, it's amplified always. It's it's not like um, I'm trying to think of a, an example, and there definitely is one, an example from Vintage Gwent, where the card, when you saw it, it sucked, but no one really ever played it that much. So it was like you never teched for it, but you hated seeing it because you weren't ever teched for it, but it was counterable. I can't think of, I don't know, Maruna kind of was like that, I suppose. But even then, I'm, I'm sure there were cards like that that were out there. Uh, Onoma Velika saying there wasn't an abundance of archetype cards in the beta, but now with only two copies of bronzes, it feels much worse. It doesn't feel like bronzes are the skeleton of the deck anymore to me. I agree. We need more cards. Yeah. More cards seems to be what people are looking at. I think that seems to be where people are leaning. Due to the low potential. I mean, oh, it's interesting because we also had a very, very long meta in the homecoming wait. And a lot of people didn't mind it that much. I felt like I felt like that time with that meta really got us to know. I mean, there was the stuff that, yeah, hand buff Nilfgaard, I think, is the thing that I'm thinking of, where if you're prepared for it, you can probably shut it down. But when you weren't prepared for it, it just handed you your ass. That's that's probably uh, that's probably the thing for me. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I think I think a lot of people a lot of people have a lot to say about. Uh, this but I think yeah card stuff um, one more thing though for for Timbo and I'll, uh, Quill I'm gonna let you answer this one first because I'm gonna get up for two seconds as you answer but Timbo is saying in the chat mm-hmm. he's saying since we're in the community section and both of you are currently drawing quite frequently I'd like to ask what got you both into drawing respectively so Quill as an art student how did you get started <laughs> as I uh, just get up you know what? I'm not gonna get up I was gonna show something that I drew but <laughs> I'll post it uh, on the sh- in the show notes later I, I want to hear your answer <laughs> all right um well, it started as like what most kids with, you know, attention issues. I uh, dislike school and I had a lot of energy. The younger, the younger Lance had actually had energy. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, but I would draw a lot and uh, I just happened to be really creative. Um, my aunt was an artist um, who actually lives out in California, does te- teaching now and does her own gallery shows and such. Oh, cool, cool. Um, but she kind of, forced it even more out of me once she saw that i was really into art she like really you know got me interested in it more giving me art stuff for birthday presents and stuff she was also my godmother so she really got me interested in it and kind of gave me that extra like push to go and get more serious with it Mm -hmm. um towards the end of high school because i was drawing pretty realistic stuff in high school and middle school and so at the end of high school i really didn't know what i wanted to do i took a year off to kind of just figure stuff out and it always kept coming back to 
that being one of the things that I love to do at the time. Um, I still love to do it. It's just, I'm not sure the direction I want to go, but yeah, that's what initially got me into art was basically attention issues. And then my aunt and then just kind of finding out that that's really what I wanted to do. That's really cool. Cause I would say that the beginning of that story is exactly the same with me. I had attention issues and I doodled all through every class I didn't like. And I did it a lot. Like I was basically like fully full on, like trying to, write and ink my own comic book like straight up in class total disrespect for the t- like my economics teacher god bless him it just i was just like full out like all my pens out just absolutely shamelessly like not trying to hide it not like doodling on the side of a test like tests that i would just this is this is just like very this one specific high school year i was all about it but other than that just a fan of comics i've just always been a fan of comics and i've always been a fan of uh uh, like comic artwork and I've picked it up and put it down over the course of my life. And right now I'm picking it up again and my chat seems to be down with the whole thing. So I'm going to keep doing it uh, for sure. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's nice to be, it's nice to have creative outlets. Like the thing about playing Gwent all the time, it's not, you're, you say you're a deck builder. Me too. I love it because that's yeah. where you can flex your creativity in a game, in a card game is, you know, I want to try to make this work. I want to try to make this work. Or I want to try to do really well with this thing that no one's trying. Um, other than that, when you play a game, you are very kind of limited to what the cards do or any game, really, what the game does. Having a creative outlet when you spend lots of time in a box, sort of, you could say with Gwent, uh, it has, you know, it's, I felt great like recently like i feel like the creative outlet for me used to be like making videos but now you know you make videos you make podcasts you do the stream it's the same all the time you're playing the same game you're talking about new things but it's very samey at the same time so having a creative outlet is great i think personally and if uh, i would recommend everybody explore their creativity if they have a creative side yeah because like you hear the classic oh i can't draw i can i can never even draw a stick person yeah and the thing with me is like Drawing, like, I sucked when I started. I mean, I, I've been drawing since I was a young kid, and I did it, like, every day. So, I mean, it, it takes it takes time. If it's something you want to be good at, then you, you just spend the time and be good at it. Yeah. Um, Like, even if it's just on the side, it doesn't take long to actually get stuff going in art. You see plenty of, you know, those karma posts on Reddit all the time. Like, when I go and just browse regular vanilla reddit and you see those on the front page where it's like oh i just took the took this drawing book and did these you know drew like once a day for like an hour and now i'm drawing this hyper realistic photo yeah like it's it, it's amazing when you just spend the time on it like it's it's weird because are we on the same website because my reddit is just like photo like paint like ms paint pictures of like a face on top of an, an old meme and just like <laughs> well black, i mean every once lines. in a while you'll get those posts and those ones always go to the top right like the, yeah. at least for me those are the quality the, posts <laughs> that's where that's where you can see like that's where you can see the real effort you know the 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 days and days and weeks and years of honing your skill when you when you ms paint that meme together um, <laughs> but yeah uh it's, it's art too it is true hey our, our humor is an art yeah yeah, it's just the same idea of like, uh, you know, I can't play guitar very well, but if I took lessons for two or three years, I probably could play it better than most people I I mean, people I know. if people can put a urinal in an art gallery and people buy it for thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars and the guy is heralded as, oh, he was a really, really skilled artist at the time, but he did it just to kind of show that artists are kind of crooks, but like at least the fine artists, but um, that's a whole other thing to get into. But you can really argue that anything is art out there as long as you have the passion for it. Yeah. So I think that's what art truly is. It's just something that you have a passion for. Yeah. I mean, I would ever, I would hate to ever be in a situation where I felt like I would have to defend something I made as art. I would, uh, and I know that people who make video games have kind of always sort of felt like this in this space, but just generally though, that feels like just like, it feels like it's a bad position to be in. It feels like, you know, if you are, yeah, if you're putting, if you're putting yourself into something, you shouldn't have to, justify or explain it it should be you know a creative endeavor and sometimes you know some creative endeavors are weirder than others some people are trying to sell urinals some people are (laughs) some people are you know somehow making brilliance out of something to the end like i never understood jackson pollock and if you guys don't know he's somebody who just appears to spray colors all over the canvas randomly but i'm sure somebody who has art history knowledge could tell me why he's a brilliant genius and why I even know his name. But I, 
I mean, he's done probably more than what I've seen, and I'm sure he's probably very skilled. But yeah, what he's yeah, known it's for more, is like the wild color abstract stuff. More or less is like a lot of a lot of those a lot of the artists you know that you kind of don't understand is is more or less they were doing it at a time where no one else was doing what they were doing, mm-hmm. and they were just very original. True. Um, yeah. Like you see people doing the same thing as him now, and they they could be almost indistinguishable between like Pollock's Pollock's work, but at this time they're derivative, so it's it's meaningless. Hmm. Yes. At the same time, though, I mean, I was never impressed. I guess I'm trying to imagine a world where the, that the, those were like impressive. Like I guess I again, our history. I'm sure it has to be you know, yeah, look at the yeah, field there's... what it was up against. I'm sure there's, there's like there's like where... there's like a whole different categories of what stuff falls under and yeah. there's like there's like there's process work there's because there's a lot of like really interesting artwork out there that the, the only thing that's really artistic about it is the process in which it was made mm. like some people go through these really convoluted ways to do something yeah like... and it's just this simple thing that you never even think they did it that way <laughs> Like, uh, uh, I can only think of like really gross examples. Like, yeah, like I drank the paint and I barfed it up and that's what it looks like. And that's the <laughs> art. That's my passion. But I mean, I'm not, 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 it sounds like I'm making fun of somebody and I think probably I kind of am, but I did it in the name of humor. <laughs> I thought it was a funny joke. Oh man, we're uh, rambling now. <laughs> Quill, you've given me like two hours of your time. This, I didn't expect this to be a longer podcast than one with Dr. Gurr, where I unexpectedly did like a two hour podcast with him about an article he wrote. I thought the patch notes would be very succinct, but we got a lot of great conversation out of here. I think there's a lot, there's a lot to, there's a lot to explore over the next few weeks with this balancing patch. Thank you so much Quill for your time. Where can people find you out there in the internet when you're doing your thing? Unfortunately, you can only find me on, fortunately you can only find me on, uh, on Twitch at Quill and Lance. Um, I'm very bad with social media. I don't have Twitter or Facebook or any of the sort. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a Discord on my uh, that you can find in my Twitch channel if you just type exclamation point Discord. Mm-hmm. Um, but I stream, you know, I stream daily, so just look out. There you go. You you sit. You let it in with unfortunate, but you know, at, coming from someone who, because um, I I do the podcast, I do YouTube videos as well. Sometimes just streaming would be. I think about some weeks where. I'm like, would there be a way where I could just be like, I'm just going to stream this month and that's, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to do that because that's, that's where I can't do the six to eight hour streams anymore. Cause I feel like there's just so much going on, but if I only streamed, man, sometimes I think that would be pretty sweet, but I love making the podcast and I really love making this one with you. Cool. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on. No problem. Coming on to the show. Uh, and you, thank you so much as well for the people who are listening and watching uh, Quill was one of the people that helped me prepare for the Gwent skirmish, which I performed mediocrely in. But the decks that we really looked at, I felt like I did pretty well with. Uh, Green Knight was also. I'd like to get Green Knight on here as well to talk uh, to talk future meta stuff as well. But the Team Leviathan guys and gals have been great friends to me. So shout out to you guys and your team as well. Shout out to Shadow Play Red, the big boss man as well. Guys have just been super cool. Um, so I just wanted to say that and thank you, Quill, for helping me. Uh, scrim as well and we should do some co-op in the future yeah for sure um to wrap this up here i can be found at mcbeard ch on twitter mcbearded on twitch and mcbeard on youtube where this will be posted asap um it's gonna take a while to export this one though so it might be friday morning when everything's all together (laughs) um but it may not be that bad because it was a smooth smooth podcast once we got things working out and discord did not fail me so thanks once again, Quill. Thanks to everybody in the chat for joining uh, as well. Uh, that'll be it. That'll be it for Podcast 102. Until next time, this is McBee. Best of luck on the path.